Good, good, good. Right, I think we're we're just about ready to go. I'm going to pass you over to James Hadley, known as Jimmy Hadley, because he covers God's country as part of Sterling Hydrotech. He's an expert on UV. He is uh, he has a wealth of experience in uh, in the swimming pool engineering uh, industry, and uh, he enjoys a few beers as well. So he's a good guy. You know, so I'll pass you on to James. One control. There we go. Lovely. I assume everyone can see that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Perfect. Okay, thank you for that lovely introduction, uh, Robin. It's probably the nicest thing you've ever said to me, so thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about UV. Um, it is one of my passions, um, something I spent a lot of time working with. Um, and I appreciate that most people, if not everyone in this, in this group, has seen a UV system, understands why they're there, understands the benefits. Um, it's always good to, to go start from the beginning, talk about the science, talk about what's changed and, and, and really just have a discussion about things that may be problems you've seen, maybe something I can clarify. Just a quick introduction to myself. Um, as Robin said, I'm an area manager for Sterling Hydrotech. I'm based in Birmingham now and I look after Birmingham uh, all the way up to Scotland. Um, Sterling are a filtration and water treatment specialist and primarily focused on swim pool industry. Um, half our business is on refurbishments of plant rooms, installation of equipment, etc. Um, the other half is about service and service and maintenance. We look after about 600 swimming pools, whether that be direct with the council, facility management companies, schools, holiday parks, but typically commercial operations. So I've got 12 years water treatment experience, which personally I think is quite long, but Everyone tells me I'm still the baby of, of the industry. So uh, 12 years, maybe not enough for most people in this group. 10 of those years was at Hanover UV based in Slough. Um, held several roles there from internal sales to European sales manager. So it's obviously where my, my passion for UV grew. And I've been at Sterling for, for 18 months. Uh, enough about me. I'm gonna talk about uh, an introduction to UV um, how it works, the different types, talk about the, the benefits within swimming pools, talk about what's new, and then a little section at the end um, with a few myths that are often said, whether it be from a customer point of view or maybe a newbie manufacturer, um, and talk a bit of an unbiased sort of opinion on it and maybe clarify a few things. So UV, um, and I always start with this photo because UV is a radiation and it's artificially created in a UV system, but it's, it's exactly the same as what is created by the sun. When we talk about sunlight and UV, it, it typically is uh, bands between UVA and UVB, which we'll talk about before, which causes suntan, sunburns, um, potentially skin cancers. Um, UVC, which is the, the important part for disinfection, is the, is the most aggressive form of UV, it doesn't actually make its way from the sun all the way down to the earth. So all light is a form of radiation and it's, it's visualized on the electromagnetic spectrum, which is, is pictured here. And light is measured in, in wavelengths, in nanometers, and, and the UV part that um, we're concerned about is between 100 to 400 nanometers. And I'll talk about wavelengths all through this presentation because it is important uh, when relating to swimming pools and and, it's, and what it does in terms of different reactions. So I mentioned before, UVC is typically what we're looking for, and that's between 200 to 280 nanometers, um, but there are, there are different bands same here. So how is it produced? Um, simplistically, the, the construction of a UV lamp is a quartz glass tube, um, and it's sealed on each end uh, with an electrode typically on each end. Uh, within the this lamp is um, it's, it's put under a vacuum and inserted is some in inert gas and a small amount of mercury. We're talking micrograms of mercury, so not a lot at all. 
what happens is you pass a current across the lamp via each electrode. It causes an arc across the lamp, which vaporizes the mercury. When the mercury vaporizes, it emits UV light, very simply. So you might hear UV manufacturers talk about UV lamps as arc tubes or mercury vapor discharge lamps. Neither very catchy, so the term UV lamp is, is typically used. Um, and the actual construction of the UV lamp is very similar to the old fluorescent tube lights you might have got in offices, um, which nowadays are getting ripped out and, and you, obviously LEDs are being put in, but very similar construction to, to those types of lamps. As UV work, and this is, this is a typical UV system um, constructed of stainless steel 316. Um, you'll see lots of different UV system shapes out there, different orientations. This is just one version. But very sim simply, uh, water passes in this chamber, past the UV lamp and out the other end. Depending on flow, um, the, re the res residence time within there is, is very quick, not even seconds. It just passes straight through it and UV does its, its damage. Um, outside, I've talked about construction. Um, outside of the chamber, you'll have a UV sensor that's located at the top of the UV system, um, and that is measuring the UV output. So that gives you an online indication of if the lamp is performing, if it's degrading, if it's failed. You'll also have a, a temperature sensor, which is always just a health and safety feature. It's not measuring the water temperature typically. Some systems it is, but typically it's health and safety. Um, the lamp within a UV system runs approximately 600 degrees Celsius um, and it's constantly being cooled by the water passing through. If you have a situation where there's no water passing through or the system drains, um, that lamp obviously will get, will get hotter and hotter and the chamber will get hot and it will, the temperature sensor is there to shut down the system. The other important feature on a UV chamber is an auto wiper system, um, pretty much a central impulse with water that contains calcium, manganese, iron, that will deposit on the, the quartz housing which the lamp sits in, it'll deposit on there and it'll block the UV light. So you have a, a wiper system that runs up and down this housing, cleans off the deposits um, every two hours, four hours, six hours, it depends. But that is the basics construction. There is no chemicals involved, it is a chemical free process. So it has one tick, should we say, for, for green, for green technology, but on the other hand, it does use a fair amount of power. So I don't think anyone is putting in a UV system based on its green capabilities, should we say. So it works. Within the water that's passing through the chamber, you'll have microbes, pathogens, viruses, chemicals, whatever it will be. UV is absorbed into these these microbes or, or even the chemicals and breaks them down very simplistically. Um, for bacteria, the term is in inactivation. Um, people might say kill, sterilize, disinfect. In the UV world, it's an inactivation process because you're stopping the bacteria from reproducing. You stop a bacteria reproducing, duplicating, it eventually it dies out, it renders itself harmless. So the overall statement that you'll hear UV companies say is that UV light is effective against pretty much everything. Um, every known bacteria, virus, uh, even, even COVID, you'll, you'll see a lot of UV systems being pushed forward for that in terms of surface infection. There is an amount of UV light that is possible to render a pathogen, should we say, harmless. It's not a one size fits all, but in terms of swimming pools, it's, it's quite simple. You're generally targeting things like Cryptosporidium and Giardia which need a very, very low UV dose. Um, typically you'll see um, a 60 millijoule dose, it's, tim it's the industry standard. That is based on combined chlorine reduction as well as, as, well as bacterial disinfection. So the most scientist part is, is generally the, the DNA disruption part. So as UV is absorbed into a bacteria, it's absorbed into the DNA and it causes a mutation. So UV will break a bond between thymine and adenine, cause a mutation. Once the DNA is mutated, it can't duplicate, it can't replicate, and it dies out. Um, and that is the very basics of it. There are other reactions involved. Um, as I said, it's, it's extremely aggressive. It'll even break down water itself. 
So between the, the H2O molecule, the, the UV will break down water into OH radicals, which are extremely aggressive, uh, have high oxidation potential, and they will, in effect, break down organics, maybe even chemicals, and things you'll see when you see potentially chlorine get stripped out by UV, this is the process it can, can go bold in. So I mentioned before, every microbe has a certain UV dose needed to, to damage it. And I, I like to relate this to uh, back to the sun in terms of sunburn, um, people with different skin types uh, get burned, e burned easier or not so easy. Similar to, to bacteria in itself, some are quite resistant to UV, some are not so much. So it's not a, a one size fits all. That is typically more important in other applications like food and beverage and or maybe municipal drinking water where they're targeting specific bacteria. So the graph at the bottom is, is bringing it back to wavelength, which will be important in our, in our next slide. There is a range of wavelengths uh, within the UV spectrum that are, that are ideal for disinfection, and it's called the germicidal range. And that is typically between 250 to 200 nanometers. The optimum wavelength is 264, but anything between 250 and 280 is good for disinfection. That brings me on to, to my next slide, which is about the, the different types of UV lamp. There are two general types of UV lamp used in industry. One is low pressure and one is medium pressure. Um, and both have their advantages, both have their disadvantages, and you will see both in swimming pools. So it's important to understand the differences and what benefits they bring. And on the left um, on this graph is uh, the output of a low pressure lamp. And the key thing with the low pressure, it produces a single UV wavelength output at 254 nanometers which fits nicely in the germicidal range between 250 and 280. So in a very simplistic way of looking at it, low pressure is effective at disinfection, inactivating bacteria. Whereas medium pressure, it has a polychromatic output. So that's the green, green and dark green, should we say, output on this graph. So between 200 to 400, there is many different output wavelengths that a UV produces at medium pressure. Lots of different outputs in the germicidal, between 250 to 280, but also other outputs outside of this range, which are quite important for chemical breakdown, such as combined chlorine. We'll talk about that a bit later, but it's just important to know the differences in terms of wavelength. Um, there are other differences. Um, physically, they're different. So a, a low pressure lamp uh, tends to be a lot longer than anything from one meter to two meters in length. Uh, and in turn, that means the chamber it sits in has to be quite long. A medium pressure lamp can be anything, it can be 20, 20 centimetres in length, maybe up to, to half a metre in length, so a lot smaller. And in turn, the chamber it sits in is a lot smaller. Low pressure lamps uh, use a lot less energy. So a low pressure lamp typically will be measured in watts, a medium pressure lamp typically in kilowatts, um, a, say a 25 metre Swimming pool using a medium pressure system would be on a three and a half kilowatt lamp in general, I'd say. So bringing that knowledge then into to swimming pools, I um, appreciate this is a, a bit basic, but I just wanted to talk about installation at first. This is a typical schematic, and every time I put a schematic up, someone picks up something that's wrong, but I don't think there's anything too wrong on this one. You've got um, an overflow pool, um, balanced tank, got your sumps taking water from the bottom of the balance tank um, via two sand filters and then into a UV, post UV you've got heat exchanger, chlorine injection point, pH injection point. The most important thing about, about UV is, is getting it in the right place. Um, you need to have it post a sand filter because you need to have a consistent water quality going through the UV. Um, anything that, that varies will influence the UV output. If you're getting solids through the UV, you might be shielding bacteria. So it's important, it's filtered water. It's also important you get full flow through the UV. Um, quite a lot of UV systems are installed on a side stream. If you have that sort of insulation, you can't offer any sort of guarantee on complete performance with UV because you're only treating some of it. Unlike things like chlorine, chemicals like chlorine, which have a residual effect all through the pool, there is no residual effect with the UV. 
So you do, it does its damage within the UV chamber and that's it. And it waits until more water comes through um, to treat at that point. So it has to be full flow. It also has to be before um, the chlorine and the pH injection points. As I said, it's quite an aggressive um, technology. If you have your chlorine injection point before, pH injection before, you're likely to strip out large amounts of these chemicals before they actually get back to the pool. It'd be an absolute waste. Concentrating specifically around the UV system, you should be installed on a bypass. Uh, this is generally for maintenance. Um, generally, you have a yearly maintenance on a UV system, and at that point, you wouldn't want to close the pool just to maintain the, the UV. So I've also met Ian, apparently. Um, so that's the bypass. Uh, also, you need to have a strainer post the UV system. Um, strainers there uh, in case, and it's, it's quite unlikely to happen, in case you get a breakage within the UV. Um, that can happen if you, if you have too high a velocity of water going through, or you've got water hammer, or maybe even someone just hitting the UV system with, with a bit of equipment. You could break the UV um, lamp and the quartz itself, of course, housing. If you do, you're going to get glass past its way to the pool. So you need to have a strainer post. It's, it's typically just a, a mesh strainer. I can't remember what, what size it is nowadays, but that's to catch glass. The problem we get and I typically see is this strainer gets full up with sand. Um, and mainly the, the issue obviously is, is you need to sort sand filter. If you do get sand leaking out of a filter, it will make its way through the UV and into the strainer. And it will it will slowly block up and, and stop basically the flow going through through the circulation. So if you do get to that point, you'll find a lot of, lot of sites will just realize that it's the UV, they'll bypass the UV or, or half bypass the UV just to solve the flow issue. Whereas really they need to be cleaning out that strainer and, and also solving the sand filter. Um, also on insulation, there is, there is now guidelines on having stainless steel um, installed on the, on the adjacent, so before and after it was connected onto the UV system. Um, there is slight variations. It can be, if it's all straight pipe work up to, I think, a metre, it's class E PVC. But in general, it should be stainless steel, uh, stainless steel elbows uh, connected on both sides of the UV system. That's just to act as a, a light trap. Uh, UV will, will degrade PVC uh, ABS quite quickly. It'll wear it away and you'll start getting leaks on, around the UV. Same as valves as well. If you haven't got a valve that's got stainless steel disc, you might start degrading it. So benefits, I appreciate most people will understand the benefits, so I won't spend too much time on them. Um, first one, and pretty much the, the, the first reason, I guess the primary reason why back in when it was 25 years plus, people started using UV systems and swimming pools was for combined chlorine destruction. Um, Previously, people were using ozone and, and UV's pretty much taken its, its place. Um, I firmly believe medium pressure is, is the primary technology for combined chlorine destruction, mainly around wavelengths. And I've, I've listed the wavelengths here, which are the optimum wavelengths to remove mono, di, and trichloramine. And you'll notice that most of them for di and, and tri are outside of that germicidal range, um, but well within the range that medium pressure can output low pressure not so much, you might get some, some monochloramine reduction from low pressure and that typically is the argument from low pressure manufacturers that if you knock out monochloramine you don't get di and tri but I don't personally believe that's the case. Next improve health benefits, um, there's only so many times you can hear a lifeguard say that they can't bear the environment of the swimming pool, um, with high levels of quine chlorine, um, you do get health benefit from that as well as um, your inactivation of your chlorine resistant bacteria such as crypto and giardia. Crystal clear water, it's um, when I was at Hovia, pretty much every marketing campaign was around no more goggles. Um, I mentioned it before, UV does have a small oxidization potential. Um, sometimes when you retrofit the UV system, um, the at the first few turnovers through the UV, the pool might go a bit cloudy. That tends to be the oxidation effect oxidizing the organics that are in the pool that obviously clears up fairly quickly. Reduction in corrosion also to do with with combined chlorine it's well known that combined chlorine 
attack stainless steel fittings, ladders, roof structures, vent ducts. Um, obviously the benefit of, of minimizing combined chlorine, you get this benefit. It's quite hard to quantify. You do get that. Similar to your ventilation system, less combined chlorine, less that's to work. Fifth is your reduced free chlorine set point. Um, a little bit of a mute point at the moment um, with obviously guidelines around coronavirus and increasing chlorine set points to, to whether it's 1.5, 2, depending on your pH. Um, however, when we're when back up and running and, and maybe some normality comes, you can have a lot lower free chlorine set points. Uh, we saw uh, when I was in Ovia, people running at 0.5. We used to recommend 0.8 milligrams per litre. In reality, most pools in the UK I see at one at best milligrams per litre. Uh, but obviously it is a benefit to have a lower, lower concentration. I'm not trying to say that it's, you're using less fluorine, you just can have a lower set point. And lastly, guaranteed performance. Um, this is something that's actually relatively new for UV in pools and it's it's been driven by municipal drinking water, industrial food and beverage companies. Um, now you can get a UV system and it's pretty much, it's Pute guidelines now to be a third party validated UV system, which means that the performance of, of the UV that you're buying has been validated by a, a party that have actually put real bacteria through it, segregate bacteria through it to prove its efficiency effectively. Um, amazingly, before this and, and for many, many years, UVs were put in on the basis of, of the theoretical sort of calculations that UV manufacturers did, never actually were tested with real bacteria, um, all done with computers, CFD, et cetera, et cetera. But now that, is, that has changed. So it's new. Um, obviously, the book is not new itself. Um, what is new is a lot of the writing around UV um, compared to the Red Book. So about four, four to five years ago, um, Futeg put together a, an industry forum where it got lots of different companies within the industry to, to get together to help uh, move, I guess, water treatment in swimming pools forward, ensure standards were, were high um, and impact obviously their experience and their knowledge. And part of this group were about four or five UV companies um, and I was, I was part of this and we got together to rewrite the UV section along with Putag um, to ensure really that the UV systems that were being installed were fit for purpose effectively. So I'm going to read a few statements just to sort of back up some of the things I've been saying. This is straight from the, the blue book. Low pressure lamps are good at killing microorganisms but do not deal directly with dye and trichloramine. So as we sort of mentioned before, Low pressure lamps, ideal for disinfection, ideal for your crypto protection, not necessarily for combined chlorine. Medium pressure lamps are good at removing chloramines as well as being biocidal. So effectively saying, medium pressure lamps offer both chlorine, chloramine reduction, construction, and also biocidal, so crypto removal and activation. Saturday disinfection of UV systems should be demonstrated by third party validation confirming three log reduction of cryptosporidium. So now there is quite clear, this is the guideline set by Plutag that we should be, all new systems should be third party validated and they should offer a 99.9% .9 reduction in cryptosporidium. Um, you should, that users should receive a certificate to say it's gone through this process um, and they shouldn't be putting anything else and I appreciate this is mainly a commercial um, sort of statement and commercial, but that's, that's the general industry that we're in. What else is new? Um, energy. Uh, I mentioned it before, UV is, a, is quite a guzzler of, of energy, um, three and a half kilowatts, only really beaten by pumps in reality in a, in a plant room in terms of circulation. So UV manufacturers are under pressure to, to obviously reduce this or ensure that it's running as efficiently as possible. So there's lots of now uh, these variable power modes, dose pacing modes. So previously a, a UV system would run at 100% full whack all the time, all through the night. Now you can ramp down a UV system so it only produces this 60 millijoules golden dose that was mentioned at all times. So that's at the beginning of the lamp life. As the lamp is degrades over time, it pumps a little bit more power obviously into the UV to keep up with the 60 millijoules. 
There's also low power modes for, for overnight links to inverters. There's, it's obviously all the rage now to, to turn off your turn down your flow rate overnight, which is never something that I really agree with. But I, I appreciate that one there is a compromise. People are looking at energy savings. You do get increased filtration performances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Connectivity, um, like everything, everything's got to be cloud connected now. It's a, it's a good buzzword. So it's the same as UV systems, they can all be linked to the cloud with remote access. These are newer, obviously, models now. Um, can offer data logging, uh, looking back at potential problems and making sure your UV was, was on at certain dosing. And interestingly, you can link them to dose, dosing controllers now. So if you've got a dosing controller that measures total chlorine as well as free chlorine, you can obviously have a calculation there to see if your combined chlorine is, is, is too high. You can send a signal to a UV system to ramp it to full power to try and reduce that combined chlorine level. Lastly, and I appreciate I've probably run out over my time, or half an hour, um, myths. So these are typical things that uh, I get told or I've, I've heard in the past, and I just want to clarify them because most of them are actually right or partially right. The first one, and probably the most important one I hear a lot, installing UV will reduce your chlorine usage. Now, this probably comes from UV manufacturers quite a while ago selling UVs on the basis that you would save on how much chlorine you use. And in theory, that is true. You should have some sort of benefit. UV should be taking away the load of some of the chlorine. However, in reality, it, it rarely happens. It, it does vary from pool to pool, vary on uh, depending on how big a UV system is. But in reality, it tends to not really be the case, whether that's because there's large amounts of chlorine going through UV and it's stripping out some of it as it's going through. Um, it does vary. but you know, it's not something that I would condone. You do get other chemical savings. If you have potentially a lower chlorine set point, you might be saving on your pH correction. Um, but really it's, for me, a U system is, there's a health and safety benefits and that's what they're for, not necessary for saving money and energy, unfortunately. Medium pressure systems are the only option for pools. Now, I tailor generally my presentations around commercial indoor pools and I do think it is the best option. However, that is not necessarily the case. So an indoor commercial pool, combined chlorine is an issue. Yes, a medium pressure system tends to be the ideal option. But if you've got a domestic pool uh, where combined chlorine is not really an issue or even an outdoor pool, uh, a low pressure system would be more than, more than adequate. A plant room is small and there's no room for UV. Um, yeah, that, that can be an issue. Um, in the past, nowadays, the, the footprint of a UV system is extremely small. I'm sure many of you have seen them. There are some UV systems you only need about 200 millimetres of straight bit of pipe work to get the chamber in. You do need a bit of air around for, for maintenance, etc. But most plant rooms will be able to retrofit a UV system now. Um, the control panel itself, that can be quite big that runs the UV, um, that can be re re installed remotely if needed, sometimes up to 100 meters away if, if, if really, really needed. UV systems need a lot of maintenance. I wouldn't say they need a lot, but they do need maintenance. I would never disagree with that. Um, like all bits of equipment, if you don't maintain them, that they will fail. In general, you should be maintaining a UV system once a year. I'd say newer systems, the lamps will last a year. The wiper seals will last a year and the quartz housing itself lasts two, two years, maybe three years, depending on what the manufacturer says. Um, also now with these validate systems, you need to recalibrate the, the sensor every year. So generally there is a maintenance period once per year, older systems maybe twice per year because the, the lamps itself only last, let's say 4,000 hours. So 4,000, 6,000 hours. So they'll be changed every six months. So yes, there is maintenance, you do have a bypass, so it's not going to cause you any disruptions with the pool. Um, so I can't really disagree. And lastly, UV lamps are difficult to dispose of. So yes, UV lamps, they do have mercury in them, which is on the hazardous substance list. Um, however, if you've got a maintenance company looking after your, your UV, as they are specialist bits of equipment, they should be looking after the lamps as well. They should take them away. I know at Sterling, we take them away and we have a waste disposal collection every month, I think it is. Um, 
if you don't want to get involved in that, I believe you can take them to your, to your local recycling centre as well. I've, I've seen quite a few there with along with the fluorescent tube lights. You can leave them there. So it is possible. You cannot you cannot just throw them away into your, into your typical waste. I believe that's the end of my presentation. It's it just gives a good overview of, of everything. And if there is any questions, more than happy to, uh, to answer them. James. Right. Yes. Yeah, I've just got a question about the, the, the chlorine consumption when you're talking about myths. And I think I think this needs to be cleared up a little bit is that yeah. um, we've seen quite over the years, we've seen quite a few pools where they're operating UV and the chlorine consumption has, has increased, you know, uh, sometimes by around 30 percent. Yeah. Now, is that is that more to do with the quality of the lamps or the, the fact that the lamps uh, output varies as the lamp gets tired? What's your take on it and what do you think is the, is the cause uh, of that? Are, are they just overpowered? Yeah, system? personally, I mean, it depends. If it's a new insulator, it's difficult. Personally, I think, and I know from experience, that most UV systems were completely oversized for the application um, when, yeah. they first, when yeah. they first in. And, and that's, I assume, is what, what's happening. It's more, yeah. yeah, it's, and I think it should be better now. And I, I say, I never ever say that you're going to be using less, but 30% is a huge amount. I know that during my time at Hanovia that, that the UV system we would put in, say 10 years ago, completely different in terms of how much UV it's exposing to water now yeah. than it was then. So I personally look, look back and think it's an oversizing. Um, they're running full whack and they're just stripping out chlorine as it's going through and you just keep dosing. Yeah, yeah, thanks. James, um, one of the delegates has asked, I think it was Dan, uh, has asked if the, the lower pH value that swimming pools are running at uh, and like the COVID guidance from PewTag, mm. will that have an impact in terms of potential corrosion for uh, UV chambers? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, are we, we're only talking like seven, what we're talking about, seven, 7.2? Seven oh, not... Yeah, work, work on seven. Work on... If, you know, if it's a, a really good pool and, and they're trying to go down to the lowest amount of chlorine that they can use, then seven is probably what they'll be aiming for just now. I, I, I would say no. I mean, typically, obviously, with we have UV systems installed in Germany running at even lower pHs and, yeah. and no, no issues. So it's not something that, I mean, it's, it, this obviously changes is outside of when I was working at a company, but I fully were well aware of, UVs that have been installed in lower pHs, UVs installed in America with, with chlorine levels through the roof. Um, there is, in terms of the general body of a stain of a, of a UV, I don't see any issues. What you do get is in certain areas of the UV system, especially around the wiper system, you have bearings and sort of um, bearing housings that you get water that kind of stagnates in there a little bit. And you do get pitting of corrosion and stuff like that. But well, that's even at the ages of 7.4 and 6. So personally, I don't see the change making any difference in terms of corrosion within the chamber itself. Would, uh, would high TDS potentially have an impact? It, not in, not in corrosion, but in terms of UV performance, massively. Yeah. So you, this is the... Uh, I probably should have mentioned it. It's when you get a on a UV system in terms of the control panel, they'll either have a, a reading that says the dose or sometimes they'll just have a percentage, which is like a re relative percentage from when the lamp was started to, to where it's at now as it's degrading. That will jump all over the place if the water quality is not suitable for, for UV treatment. And, and TDS, really high levels of TDS is, is one of the main ones, turbidity another one. So yes, if you've got high levels of TDS, you will, be above, I guess, what a UV manufacturer would have specified in terms of the water quality it's expecting. A lot of it is um, guesswork, should we say. You're, you're with a swimming pool, it's quite standard filtration. You're expecting a certain level of, uh, of quality water. Um, high TDS will, will basically, very simplistically, make it cloudy water. The cloudier the water, the harder it is for UV to transmit through. Um, if it doesn't transmit through the water fully, it can't get to the bacteria, it can't get to, to the chemicals that combine chlorine, and it can't do its, its work. So, yes, it is an issue. It's coming back to the turbidity question, isn't it? Um, whether we should be testing turbidity more regular 
in swimming pools. Those that have got UV, it might be it might be worth trying to include turbidity on your monthly bacteriological analysis. You can get that done at your lab. Um, it's uh, you know if you've got UV and your your TDS is high and you think you're you've got a very high loaded swimming pool, then the turbidity uh, analyzing that is probably a good a good option. Uh, one one uh, what one question I've got, uh, James, is. Uh, the, the, the old Olympia in Dundee, um, they used to clean the, the quartz tubing uh, using a citric acid or something uh, similar, lactic acid or citric acid, just to remove any kind of uh, film that, that, that maybe covers the, the quartz tubing and affects the performance of the UV lamp. Is that something that is done uh, in other facilities or is recommended or... Uh, is that part of the service process of Sterling Hydrotaker? So it's not, it shouldn't be needed, that sort of, that sort of clean in a swimming pool, but it is, it is seen. So I generally see it in more dirtier water applications. So oh, there are right. UV systems out there on, on wastewater that have its own sort of CIP cleaning process where it will fire in a bit of chemical, whether it be citric or something a bit more powerful, um, offer, it, offer a clean. If you're, if you've got sort of comp if you've got deposits that that need an acid clean, then there is generally a an issue with your, you know an issue with the water. Mm -hmm. Frankly, you're probably looking at wanting to soften your water or something like that. Mm -hmm. what it is. Um, so it's not normal. Um, the, the the manufacturer's recommendation is actually not to use any any acid product at all. They just all you should use is is warm, maybe warm soapy water at most. Um, uh, anything, anything that's got acid in it is likely to attack the, the quartz itself, um, and then that's going to cause you further problems. So, obviously, a light acid like citric, I guess if that, you know, it's not not the end of the world, but it's not recommended. Okay, that answers the question. Uh, anyone else got any other questions for James? Thanks very much, James. Uh, no great presentation. Um, James works for Stellan Hydrotech. They can install these these systems. They do uh, a variety of installations of um, pool plant nature, uh, filtration, refurbishments, um, design and build. Uh, they also do maintenance. Uh, if you have any questions relating to um, pool plant operations and, and engineering aspects, then by all means, Get in touch with myself, Ian Ogilvy, or James, um, and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to, to answer them. And you know, I'm sure James, if you if you want to speak to James about any business or whatever, then you can go to Sterling Hydrotech, and uh, you'll be able to get in contact with James from there. Um, I'm pretty sure his his details are fairly easy to get a hold of. Uh, if you can't, then contact myself or Ian, and uh, we'll put, we'll put you in touch with him. Can you do me 